In this video, we're going to consider what happens to potentials and potential differences in this circuit as we let a capacitor charge up. So the key thing to understand, and hopefully you've learned it so far, is that as a capacitor charges, at the very beginning, when the plates are neutral, it's easy to take charge off of one plate, put it on the other plate. The capacitor acts as like basically a bare wire. At, after a long time, when the plates are getting uh, close to fully charged, it's very difficult to move electrons from one plate to another. So the capacitor almost acts like a break in the circuit or an open switch. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna examine this circuit. I have three uh, resistors in here. Two of them are relatively small um, and one of them is huge. The one that's huge is in parallel with the capacitor. We're gonna see that that's what's called a bleeder resistor and it has a very specific purpose in a circuit containing capacitors. We'll get to that later. What I'd like to do first is basically make a prediction before I hook up uh, any of this stuff, what I think each of these should be. So because the bleeder resistor's value is so much bigger than uh, the resistance in series with the capacitor, at least at first when the capacitor acts as a, a wire, almost all the current is gonna be traveling in this branch and we're gonna have very little here. So the circuit's not gonna be that different than a series RC circuit like we saw in the previous video. We'll have about a thousand ohms total resistance, which is much less than the resistors we saw in that video. The smaller one was, was 51,000. But check out the capacitor. Whereas before we were dealing with uh, 0.1 microfarad and 10 microfarad, now we're dealing with one farad. So like 100,000 times larger than the one we were dealing with. These capacitors uh, have an enormous capacitance and we saw that both resistance and capacitance contributed to how long it took to charge it. So we expect this capacitor to take an extremely long time to charge. I never got it fully charged. I gave up after about 80 minutes. But let's look at how the circuit behaves and it will be a good introduction to how we can do calculations involving circuits with capacitors. At the beginning, I think it would be helpful to see if we can think of any path for current. We basically got a break. So because the capacitor has no charge and because uh, there's no path for current to flow, I think at the beginning we should predict zero volts for all of them. except of course this one, because that's not a resistor. So let's take a look at the circuit. When you see the circuit built using all our alligator clips and things like that, it actually looks pretty ugly. I wanted to get the document camera in here because you're mostly gonna be seeing it from above. And uh, I just wanted to kind of give you some perspective. Um, we have our five volt power supply here. Um, the next thing it's connected to is a 715 ohm resistor. That's this one. Then there's a switch, which is kind of in there. Um, a 390 ohm resistor and a one farad capacitor, which is a huge capacitance, but we've also got a really enormous resistor, 507 kilo ohms. As you can see at the beginning, with the switch open, we have no potential difference across any of the three resistors. So now we're going to close the switch. And again, the capacitor is uncharged at the beginning. So that means it acts just like a wire. So I'm just going to sketch the circuit in that situation. We'll basically have our uh, battery. We'll have our 715 ohm resistor. The switch is closed, so I'm just going to draw that as a bare wire. We have R2. We have R3. The capacitor is a bare wire. So we're just kind of back to the beginning. All right, so here's my results. And as you can see, I started by calculating the resistance of these two in parallel. 
And you could see that it's the same resistance as the smaller resistor because 507,000 ohms is huge compared to 393. We've said that opening up parallel branches of a circuit decreases resistance because you've given more opportunity for charge to flow. But this would be like having a local road and putting a small footpath through the woods next to it. Very few charges are gonna flow this way, so it doesn't effectively decrease this resistance at all. The second thing I did is I put the combined resistance here um, and I found what the total resistance of the circuit would be simplifying it to this. So now I know the total current through the circuit, which in reality passes through the 715 ohm resistor. Um, I could just do ohm's law to find it. And I come up with 0 0.00451 amps. Sorry, amps. So for the 715 ohm resistor, I just do V equals IR for that one resistor multiplying and I get 3.23 volts predicted uh, for that. Now, according to Kirchhoff's uh, loop rule, um, all of the additions and subtractions of potential around the circuit are zero. So if our input voltage is five and one of them's dropping 3.23, that means this resistor should get 1.77 volts as its voltage drop. And of course, that's the potential across both of these two. So I've recorded them there. So that's what we got. Uh, let's take a look at what really happens. All right, so I'm going to close the switch and start the stopwatch at the exact same time. And we'll see what we get. I think that's very close to predicted. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let the capacitor fully charge. Because of the very large capacitance here, um, that is probably gonna take a long time. So we'll come back to it and we'll use it for the next part of our circuit. In the meantime, we'll calculate what we predict uh, the potential of the cross all of these will be when the capacitor fully charges. All right, so just let's make a quick sketch of what we think the potential is at every place in the circuit. We're starting uh, at position A here, and we're defining that as having zero volts. So as we go across the battery, we expect to pop up to five volts. And then as we go across resistor one, uh, we get a drop of 3.23 volts. So that brings us down to 1.77. So something like here. And at the very beginning, there's not going to be any potential difference across the capacitor. It's acting like a bare wire. So after we get across resistor two, which is point E. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we've got the switch. Um, the switch is actually going to be closed at this point. So I really should have drawn that like this. So at point D, uh, that's acting as a bare wire. So we have exactly the same there. Um, once we get across R2, we're essentially down to being directly connected to point A because C1 is acting like a capacitor. So we've lost all our potential at that point. So if we were gonna sketch our graph, be something like that. So when the capacitor gets to be fully charged, um, essentially it acts as an open circuit. So let's take a look at what that would look like uh, for us. We'd have our power supply. We'd have R1. The switch would be open.
We still have R3, the really big, big one. And now we've got an open circuit. It's like we've got another switch here um, in place of a capacitor. So I should have still drawn the resistor, but at the end of the day, that resistor is no longer part of an active circuit. The only path for current to flow in this case is through the mass of resistor. So let's make predictions of what we think the final potential differences should be across my two capacitor two resistors, keeping in mind that we don't have a circuit now through uh, R2. So in this case, I guess we could combine it into a simple ser uh, single resistor circuit. And RS is just going to be 715 ohms plus 507,000 ohms. So RS, of course, is going to be 507,715 ohms. So if we do Ohm's law, our five volts will be equal to I times 507,750 or 715. So I will end up being 9.85 very small, 9.85 times 10 to the negative six amps. So if we look at our voltage drops across those, the voltage drop across R1 should be 715 times 9.85 times 10 to the six. That's gonna be 0 0.007. So a very, very, very small uh, uh, potential difference. R2, um, current's not flowing through that at all. So V equals IR, when I is zero, we expect no potential difference across R2. And that means based on the fact that current's all passing through the 507,000 kilo ohm resistor, we'll just multiply our current by that number and that will give us a, a potential difference across that. So that's going to be 4.999 volts. So essentially the entire five volts. So as we look at these, we really expect R1's value to be decreasing, R2's value to be decreasing, and this value to be slowly increasing for R3. We look at our timer now, it's been about 10 minutes since I hooked up the circuit. Let's see what the, uh, the meters are up to. So that is what we're seeing. We have uh, the potential across R1, the 715 ohm resistor is continuing to drop. Across R2, the one in series with the capacitors continuing to drop and we're continuing to increase on the really big resistor that's in parallel. So we'll see how long it takes for that to uh, get to our predicted five volt voltage drop across this resistor and zero across both others. All right, it's been uh, 21 minutes. So a um, little more than twice the time is when I last checked in on you. So we're at around half an hour. Uh, 31 minutes, and notice we're up to 4.34 volts across the 507 mega ohm resistor. So we're up uh, close to 41 minutes now, 
And notice we're at a 4.52 volts. All right, so now we're around 50 minutes and across the big resistor, we got 4.63 volts. All right, so it's been an hour. Big resistor is up to 4.71 volts. Both of the other, uh, so after 70 minutes, uh, we're at 4.76 volts across the big resistor. Clearly this is really slowing, slowing down. All right, so we're now at about 90 minutes and I'll be real, this is about as much patience as I've got to sit here and wait. Um, we are going to get to the point at some point where this becomes fully charged to the five volts we expect. So what I wanna do now is just kind of talk about um, what we see uh, in this circuit and what we could predict the potential difference across the capacitor would be. And then I wanna make that same graph of potential versus position that we did before. So uh, first things first, um, we know that basically the capacitors in this location here where I have the open switch, and we know that between point D and point F, we have the same potential difference. So that's the potential difference across the big resistor and across this whole branch. Since no current's flowing in this branch, since it's basically gonna be acting as an open circuit, um, that means there's no voltage drop here. And that means the capacitor and the big resistor get the same potential difference. So if this is really five volts, then the potential difference across the capacitor is also gonna be five volts. Okay, what do we know about charge? Charge is equal to capacitance times voltage. And this is a one farad capacitor. And the potential difference is five volts. So the charge will be five coulombs. So that's what we got for charge across this capacitor. So what I'd like to do now is sketch my potential at various points in the circuit. At point A, we're starting at a potential of zero. When we get across the battery, so what I'd like to do now is sketch uh, the potential as we go around the circuit on this graph. So starting at point A, uh, we have zero volts. When we go across the battery, we have five volts. There's very little voltage drop across the 715 ohm resistor because there's gonna be so little current flowing when we get this fully charged since this resistor is so big. So we're basically at point C, still gonna have a potential of about five. Point D is directly connected since the switch is open, or the switch is closed, so that's still about, about five as well. Point E, there's no current flowing through this branch at all, so there's no voltage drop across the 393 ohm resistor. So at point E, we're still at five. And the entire voltage drop is going to be across the big resistor. So when we get to point F, we'll be back to zero. So that's Kirchhoff's loop rule what it's telling us in this situation. If this is the circuit, I'm not going to draw all of it because once we open the switch, this part is isolated. The power supply and the 715 ohm resistor are no longer in it. So all we have is the, the one farad capacitor, a 393 ohm resistor, the big resistor, and that's it. So I guess uh, if we were gonna be looking at the different potentials at different places, so as we try to consider what will happen when we disconnect this, um, soon as we do, the capacitor is going to begin discharging. Um, so if this is our positive plate, this is our negative plate, what we know is that electrons will flow through resistors to get back here. And using conventional current, we'll see that there's a current that forms in that direction. Um, what is the current? It's going to be pretty small. This is basically a series circuit and this is charged to five volts. So if we have a five volt 
potential difference. That's current times our total resistance, which will be 393 plus 507,000. That's going to be a really small current. So our current in that case would be 5 divided by 507393. We get 9.86 times 10 to the negative 6 amps. So our predicted voltage drop in that case is going to be um, for the 393 ohm resistor almost zero. And that means that for the big resistor, it's going to be basically all of it. So 4.996. The other resistor is not in the circuit at all, so we would predict zero. So let's disconnect that. And you can see that we're almost at an hour 40 minutes, we're still only up to 4.85 volts. So we're really starting to slow down at this point. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to open the switch, disconnect uh, the, the battery, and we'll start timing from, from that point. And we'll see how quickly that uh, potential difference goes away. So stop, reset. Um, opening the switch right about now. And we'll let it start to decay. I wanted to finish the lab by discussing what the point of the uh, large resistor was and where you would see this in a real actual circuit. As we can see, it's parallel to the capacitor in this resistor. And we'll say that those are the things that we'd actually want to be doing stuff in our circuit, something useful for us. This enormous resistance under normal conditions when the circuit's operating, very little current is gonna flow through this resistor. It's named a bleeder resistor because it has one really big job. We're not using dangerous voltages here. This capacitor is not requiring um, a charge that's going to hurt somebody. But in many devices, such as old television sets, uh, other consumer electronics, power supplies, uh, there's capacitors inside that are at very high voltage and it could really shock somebody. And leaving that charge in there indefinitely isn't really safe. So what you can do is you can put in parallel across your device, you can put this bleeder resistor. And when the device is running, it's gonna have almost no effect because that's such a high resistance and very small currents are going through. But once you turn the device off, you give a path for things to discharge. So these values I chose here would not be ideal for a bleeder resistor. It's just gonna take forever to discharge. We're approaching 10 minutes now, and we're still at 4.7 when we started at um, you know, around 4.8 something. But at the end of the day, you come back a week from now, two weeks from now, there's not going to be charge on this capacitor. And that could be something that saves somebody's life down the road when they're working. So hopefully this gave you some practice in dealing with circuits that have more than just resistors in it. I hope you feel comfortable using progressively simpler circuits and also using Kirchhoff's rules. And uh, that's about it.